I just came to Skype with webcam for a while. I realized webcams uh, use a lot of bandwidth um, with institutions that don't have much speed. So I just want to say hello, wave hello. It's me, that's what I look like. It's a real person, it's not a computer talking. Okay, um, I'll just switch that off. There we go. Okay, as uh, Anna said previously, I've done some uh, videos of the uh, installation of DSpace, uh, which I presented with the uh, first uh, the webinar. So there are, uh, the, in the work with DSpace doesn't end with the installation. There's a lot of work after that to get it ready in production mode. Uh, and I just want to briefly go through that with the slides. And, uh, and then I will do videos over the weekend, hopefully over the, the course of next week, they'll be up on YouTube uh, for you to view. So, uh, as I can see now, from the, we have quite a few attendees on the list, and a very interesting one is Michael Guthrie from Knowledge Arc. And I see I have some compatriots from Ghana and Malawi. Hello to everybody from Africa, you're very welcome. Okay, to begin, uh, there's my uh, contact details. Um, so yeah, there are my contact details here, there, um, and then later on when Nation presents, there's his contact details. Okay. So please send me an email. This is my work email, and this is my private email. Okay, to begin. Okay, what tasks are there to complete immediately after installation? Well, very important is to do the daily admin tasks. So this is also suggested by uh, the DSpace developers. Uh, this is required, for example, to send out email subscriptions uh, for people who want to be notified of new additions to collections they subscribe to. Um, this also builds, uh, updates the indexes, which are very important for searching. So if you add new content during the day, during the evening or late at night uh, or early in the morning, um, these the jobs or scripts that run to update indexes. So this is critical. This is actually not negotiable. This must be done after uh, the DSpace installation. Uh, the next one is uh, the rebuilding of DSpace. Um, my installation procedure recommends that you download the source code of DSpace, not just the binaries, so that uh, you can become familiar with modifying the source code and customizing DSpace to suit your um, particular needs at your institution. And you don't want to keep uh, typing uh, repetitive commands for rebuilding DSpace after customization. So I've added a sample rebuild DSpace script. Okay, the next thing uh, for, uh, there might be some institutions that are, have made the right decision to host their own DSpace with their own hardware at their own institution. But some of them may not have uh, enough resources to buy a really uh, powerful, uh, suitable uh, piece of hardware or server hardware. So I've added a reslot DSpace script there so that uh, uh, you can reslot DSpace if it runs out of um, RAM or any other resource with database, database connections, etc. Um, with DSpace, with our old server and DSpace 4, um, I used to restart DSpace at quarter to eight every day and make my institutional repository uh, ready um, for um, operational management during the day. Um, so that when the people came at eight o'clock, uh, my DSpace, which we call Sunstar, was ready. Uh, and then another one here, um, indexes very, the, the, the big utility of the DSpace repository is that it can build its own indexes and you can search through its own indexes. So you may want to customize those indexes. Um, DSpace comes out with a de default set of indexes like author, uh, subject, uh, date issued. And you may want to uh, create an index, say, by uh, department or faculty or maybe a supervisor and so on. So um, when you customize those indexes, I'll take a little rebuild index uh, script. Probably needs some improvement, but it's a beginning. Okay, so these are definitely, uh, these four are definitely required after, uh, immediately after the installation of DSpace. Now, as I said, I will, I will um, do some videos from home this weekend and try and post them up to YouTube next week. Okay. Just to go into more detail about the daily admin, the, the first one, the daily admin. Um, as I say, yeah, just off installation, it's critically important to enable daily automatic tasks. 
Um, this sends out subscription emails, uh, updates the search indexes, updates the browse indexes, the full text indexes, and a general daily housekeeping on the system. Uh, it's based on a Unix Linux system uh, and it uses what we call the cron tab facility. So for more details about that, there's the link there. And then for more details about using cron in, in Linux uh, is available there. Okay, the rebuild, again, uh, this one is uh, very handy. So as I, as I mentioned, if you apply customizations, you need to rebuild the uh, DSpace. And you don't want to keep typing uh, all those commands. So uh, just to give you an overview of uh, customization and how much there is available to do in customization. And you'll be very happy to have this rebuild script. And uh, here are the links uh, to build the script. Um, this assumes, of course, that you've installed DSpace according to the, the webinar videos earlier um, that I've up uploaded. Again, you have to restart DSpace script. Like I said earlier, um, if you do a DSpace configuration change, you want to restart DSpace. Uh, if you do an updated or uh, a new customization, or restart manually after system failure, or restart automatically uh, using a new contact. So the, uh, there's, a, there's a subtle difference between the rebuild and the restart. The restart does not rebuild. The restart just uh, restarts the Tomcat server, cleans out the uh, uh, cocoon caches, restarts the database, and, and then starts up Tomcat again. Whereas the rebuild will actually go and they stop the Tomcat. Uh, if you look at the script, you'll see it stops the Tomcat and rebuilds the application. So the restart is, is, is completely different from the rebuild. There's a subtle difference. Okay, uh, and then there's the script. Uh, how to create the script, uh, there's the link to create the restart script. And as I said earlier, there's the rebuild index script. And uh, as I said, if you make any changes to the indexes, you need to rebuild them. And there's the link uh, to, uh, to actually go and do the build and rebuild script. All of these, of course, uh, the assumption is you install DSpace according to my recommendations. After those tasks that are completed and you've done them um, almost immediately after the installation, uh, then I very strongly suggest that uh, you take your time and go through uh, the optimizations. Uh, you probably need to optimize, uh, optimize your, your um, Tomcat server, optimize your Java installation, and how much RAM you want to give to the Java, etc. And you probably, if you're using, select to use a PostgreSQL database, you want to optimize the PostgreSQL database. And I've got instructions there. The next thing, uh, very important, um, is to set up the handle server. The handle server enables a machine readable digital object identifier. So the handle uh, server will give each item a DOI, and an item being a collection or an upload with its metadata, etc. Then, very important, uh, is to secure your server if you're hosting your own server. Um, please check the internet security and secure your server. And then when you've done all that hard work and everything, please start thinking uh, very seriously about setting up a disaster recovery system. Um, that is an entirely another webinar on its own, uh, um, but it's also a very important part of the uh, long-term sustainability of the repository. Uh, there have been some horror stories about the repositories being built, hardware failing, and all the assets have been lost, uh, and even some born digital assets. So please, please make sure um, you look at these tasks. Uh, it's a very important task to do um, after the installation, especially, most especially and critically, if you host your own server and your own hardware. Okay. And also just check with, uh, if you have a service provider, that they do this. Uh, it's also a good idea to make sure that they also have uh, long-term sustainability as one of their uh, features or services or uh, whatever. And for long-term sustainability, also make sure that you can import and export your assets from uh, any proprietary service provider system. Okay. 
So the next, so just to go into a little bit more detail, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, there's optimizations. The major optimization is the Tomcat web app server. And uh, what I call the NCSQL database, whether it be Oracle or PostgreSQL. But I have tips on um, optimizing the SQL database. And I have further some other tips uh, there as well in, in this page here. And then uh, DSpace itself has some uh, documentation on performance tuning DSpace. Uh, so if you have hard, if you have a, if your hardware is critically under resourced, uh, I would very strongly suggest looking at this optimization. Okay, the next thing, and this is not negotiable, if you uh, have both good digital collections, uh, uh, as the uh, ANSI and NICE standard recommends, you should have digital object identifiers, machine readable digital identifiers. So. Um, just go to this website, uh, register for a handle, apply for a handle. Um, there's all the documentation on how to do it there. And then here's the documentation, my documentation, um, how to enable handle server, uh, apply the handle server, apply handles uh, retrospectively, uh, troubleshoot the handle server, etc. So uh, this, uh, this after installation task is actually not negotiable if you're building a good digital trusted repository, you must have a handle server. So this is definitely needed. Okay. And then there's lots to cover. I can't stress this enough. Uh, if you are hosting your own system, please, please make sure that um, that you have a, a disaster recovery uh, system in place for um, for long, long term sustainability. And uh, in addition, you also, uh, if you're a good uh, system administration practice, is to be able to monitor the servers uh, and to be able to get alerts from the servers when something gets goes wrong. So uh, again, there is the link on my documentation. Uh, again, that is uh, very important uh, for those who are hosting their own systems. And is uh, I could spend quite a bit of time talking about how I set that up and. Uh, what we do to make sure uh, about disaster recovery. Disaster recovery also as a concept is not just the, the hardware and setting up backup servers, it's also making sure that you have people to uh, manage your disaster recovery systems and recover from the disaster. Machines by themselves don't recover from disasters. Okay, all right, the next slide. Okay, then these are tasks to complete at a later stage. Uh, they're not critical after the installation, but they should be done uh, to complete uh, the installation of your DSpace. Uh, you want to do research, uh, you want to make sure that only authorized people can upload and uh, deposit uh, items to your repository. So research authorization uh, is uh, very important. So if you're in a a research institution, you want to make sure that only authorized researchers may uh, connect to your repository and upload items. The next thing for, uh, for citation and impact, uh, etc., is to make sure that you clearly identify the researchers. So if you have two researchers that are John Smith, you can identify um, each of them individually. And DSpace has enabled uh, that with the awkward uh, integration. Uh, it was supplied by FMIR. So I strongly suggest uh, enabling the ORCID integration um, to disambiguate uh, researcher names. And then uh, I have the, the then there's customization. Now the big after installation customization talk is usually uh, to theme the website uh, so that uh, sorry to theme your repository so that ha it has your uh, corporate look and feel and uses your corporate palette, palette being a, uh, a layout of colors. So, um, for example, at uh, Sunwell University, I use the palette for maroon, orange, gray, and black, I think. Those are our corporate colors. So I try to theme my website according to that. And then after that, uh, normally the web analytics making a good, uh, making sure that your repository is Google friendly, uh, Google search friendly, and also Google Scholar friendly, and uh, make sure it, it, uh, it's, it's findable in the search indexes of Google. 
uh, and make sure that um, items are properly cited and referenced in Google Scholar and that the items have the Google Scholar method. There's a, there, okay. This is again uh, a, a totally in another presentation that I could spend a lot of time on um, the, the critical and non-critical customizations. But definitely the thing to do afterwards. This should take um, a couple of weeks to a couple of months actually. Uh, and I suggest uh, doing most of your customization on a development system and then applying to the product, applying, applying it on a production system. You don't want to play around on a, plug, on a production system with customization. Rather, um, test your customizations on a development system and then apply them to uh, that is good uh, and best practice for system administration and for operations. Okay, and then, of course, system administration. Um, so what I do daily with the system administration is I make sure the backups are run. Uh, I go and check on the monitoring of the servers, make some, check my monitoring of the servers to make sure none of the servers have problems or running out of disk space or running a RAM or any problems like that. So um, yeah, it's just daily tasks. Um, I also not only run uh, and maintain the repository, I also maintain an open journal system and I maintain an open conferencing system. And I'm waiting for the university to apply a research data management uh, policy and then I'll be managing the research data system that they want to do. Um, so it's, it can be quite a, a busy day. All right. So these are to complete lead run. Um, just as important as the others, but they're not as critical in time wise. Uh, this is the one here, this customization one, is the one that's going to take a lot of your time after the installation. Okay, just to go into a bit more detail, research authorization. As I said earlier, the digital assets must only be managed by authorized users. Uh, this is a, probably a critical tenet of a trusted repository, you want to assure researchers that only authorized people are managing their assets on, on, on the repository. Uh, just a bit of detail, DSpace authenticates using what we call uh, ePerson accounts um, or uh, LDAP server accounts. Uh, this, is, this is the part where you integrate, um, sorry, this, this one here is where you integrate with your campus identity management system on it. The e-person accounts here are local accounts and normally don't... Uh, every account is an e-person account and can either be an LDAP account or a VIN. But a, the original account um, in the beginning of the repository is an e-person account. Okay, as I say, yeah, the wiki page describes setting up DSpace to use the institutional LDAP server for peer reviewing. And uh, uh, just a little tip from my experience, um, Try to make sure that the LDAP server has one tree. Uh, it doesn't have multiple trees, uh, or, and you don't have multiple L LDAPs on campus. It's very difficult to integrate DSpace with uh, an LDAP that has a separate LDAP for students, and for example, and a separate LDAP for staff. It's ideal um, if you have one LDAP tree, one simple LDAP tree to, to, um, to link to. Right, and after you've done the provisioning, then the important part is to make sure that the repository manager defines privileges uh, for individuals in there, uh, for particular collections. Okay, so more details about LDAP there, um, so that you can uh, refer to your campus identity management manager. Just tell them that DSpace can connect to an LDAP server and. Uh, it would be convenient if they uh, provide an LDAP interface for you to connect to your campus identity management system. And then, here's yeah, the link on my documentation how uh, to uh, enable a critical research authorization. Okay, as I said earlier on, researcher identification. Very critical dis to disambiguate uh, researcher names. Uh, you want to a, a unique research identification system. Uh, for example, I was asked by our library director if we could um, generate reports per researcher and I said not really because we can't identify unique researchers in the DSpace repository. So that uh, kind of cramps the style of DSpace. Uh, I'm hoping that this becomes a much more, this whole thing becomes a much more important part of DSpace. 
so that we can have accurate reporting. As I said earlier, um, this invigorates author names. Um, there are means machine readable, great for machine you know, interoperability, so that there's no uh, confusion about author names when there's interoperability. And it enables you to cluster research information around individual researchers. Okay, um, we're able to enable ORCID uh, uses the what the Sun Scholar Authority Control mechanism as the basis. So there's some documentation on authority control. And then here's my uh, documentation uh, um, to enable ORCID on, on this space. Okay, here's the big one. <laughs> we could spend days on this one. There's a lot of technical details of customization to do afterwards. Um, like I said, the big one is the theme. Um, and uh, just a tip, please read about the advanced customization methodology with DSpace, the overlay method. That will save you a lot of time. Um, it separates your custom code from the source main code of DSpace. And that's how my documentation is based as well. I try to stick to, as far as I can, to uh, these spaces recommendations when doing customization and using the overlay method. So there's my documentation on customization. I could spend a couple of days going through that. An important part of uh, after installing these spaces to do customization. Okay, um, system administration. Uh, also very important for the long-term sustainability of the repository. Uh, so after building the system, you need to do regular server maintenance, uh, which involves um, not only just the backups, but uh, making sure that you do software upgrades to ensure that uh, your software remains secure, very important. Um, and then also in the mornings, I come in and I check on my servers. Uh, I have a I'm looking after, if I think correctly, about 40 servers now. It just keeps adding as the router wants to do more and more stuff and they find that open source and open technology stuff is uh, easy to implement and doesn't require complex licensing methods, for, for example, with uh, the other major server provider, which I won't mention names. Uh, so as, I, as, as they find that I can deliver more services quickly and faster than the other systems. Um, my server list that I look after keeps growing. I'm trying to reduce the size uh, you know, by um, being a good system administrator and looking after the risk. But the list just keeps growing. Anyway, he has the link to uh, basically what a system administrator does. But it's a very important task um, for the long-term sustainability and uh, keeping your repository healthy is very, very important. Okay, I think that concludes my part. I sort of rushed through it. It might seem like, um, and this is where Nathan will take over, I just want to make a few comments before he does, um, is to please, um, later on, like I said, I'll do the videos, and then and I'll hopefully later on we'll follow up with those videos. And in those videos, I will actually show you what I've done as much as I can uh, using a virtual virtual environment. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to uh, Mason now and stop broadcasting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hilton. Um, my name is Nason. Here I am. Um, and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone who's, who's joined us uh, for this presentation. Um, as Hilton has mentioned, um, I'm going to talk about a bit on customization, just to give you a flavor of what is um, required, what you need to know, and uh, what sort of uh, uh, tools you need. Um, and then, uh, as Hilton has mentioned, we're going to go through another uh, presentation, which will really delve into more of these uh, details that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so. To do customization, uh, here I'm just looking at it from the point of view of making the DSpace your own. That is um, the website, the look and feel, and um, 
the, the other bits that you need. For example, you want to uh, implement a multilingual user interface. You want to improve uh, interoperability. And, and just looking at um, uh, a, a basic statistics uh, using Google Analytics. Uh, so, so that's what we we I'm going to talk about. Um, so, to start with, obviously, uh, Dispace as a software is is a very huge application, and it uses a lot of uh, standard um, uh, standard pieces of software and techniques and and, and methods to 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 do that. Uh, so, for example, uh, Dispace doesn't uh, doesn't have HTML directly, so the the web browsers normally display um, things on the screen via HTML. But this space doesn't give you HTML. It generates the HTML on the fly as the user wants to access that, and uh, it does that through the standards that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, so these are the type of uh, knowledge that you might require. Uh, basically, this space uses a lot of XML. Uh, which is uh, extensible markup language. It's just a simple ASIC text file, which is called the key value pair. So it's like, uh, think of it like uh, in a spreadsheet, you have uh, column names and then you have the values. So that's what it is. Now, with XML, you need to be able to transform that XML from one format to the other, for example, from uh, a one format of XML to another format of XML or HTML. So you use uh, uh, these um, extensible style sheets and then you transform them via XSL transformations. Uh, the look and feel, things have changed now with uh, front-end development. Um, long time ago when I started uh, programming, uh, we used to embed everything, logic, within um, within the, the, the display. Now there is a separation between um, uh, the actual content and the, how you lay it out on the screen. And hence, uh, uh, cascading style sheet, which is CSS, is, is the thing that you use to, to do that. So you have your, you can have your XML or your HTML, but to tell the browser where, where to put it, what color to use, you use the CSS. So those are the links that you might need uh, if you want to learn more. You s if you are to do really good customization, you need to know these things. Um, the other thing that you might need to know, which would help you uh, do uh, quickly uh, the customization, is to use uh, uh, the built-in uh, web developer tools. They are found in all browsers. Uh, I normally use the one with uh, uh, Chrome. Uh, if you hit F12, I think in Firefox it's the same, uh, you get um, a Java, uh, a, an Ajax type application that will overlay over your, 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 your page and then you can play around with the uh, changing the CSS, see how they look like, and then changing the actual entries in the CSS file. Um, the other thing that you might need, uh, you need is, uh, if you are gonna make your site uh, discoverable via search engines like Google, or you want to do uh, um, uh, Google uh, Analytics, uh, then you need to know a bit more about Google Webmaster Services. Um, this you have to sign in, you have to register, and you, it's got a lot of instructions on what to do to make your site um, easily discoverable, how to monitor your site, uh, and, 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 and also how to do your statistics from there. So it's a, it's a, it's a good place to go to. Um, the other thing that uh, we, you need to understand with this space, as with any other software, uh, is about the separation between the core and your your your, ch your, your changes, the changes that you make. As um, Hilton has alluded to, um, this space uses a concept of overlays. Uh, 
uh, so what it means is you have your core source code, which is this space for this space, and then whatever you want to change within this space, you have to do it in the overlays. Uh, similarly, if you want to write your own Java program that will do certain things that you don't like within this space, you want to customize, you have to, you, to add your Java code in there, but inherits uh, the core code, uh, the code from the other, uh, the code this space. All the user interface customization, everything has to be done within the overlay. Um, you might have noticed for some of you that have tried, if you change the logo, for example, on the actual this space um, um, live uh, folder, uh, the next time you rebuild things revert back to the way they were. It's because uh, you didn't change them in a proper position. So good practice requires you to use uh, overlays. Uh, there is um, uh, a slide, some set of slides that were done by Tim uh, on uh, their own slide share. There's a, a link there. It explains what this concept is all about. Um, obviously, uh, the, for the past um, slides, Hilton has, has, has run, has, has used some of the tools that, that you need to know, uh, for example, SSH. Uh, in, in most cases, uh, you might not be you know, running your own servers or your servers are run by uh, a separate unit. So they might not allow you to, 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 to have access to the server directly. So you need to do remote access. And that's what Hilton has always uh, used. Uh, that was used SSH. And if you are on Windows, there is a set of program called Party that you can download and use. Um, the other one that, uh, for those that come from Windows, uh, it, it gives you a graphical user interface is WinSCP. It's got uh, uh, it's got FTP, it's got all the facilities, but what it does is it's just an overlay over the party system. Uh, so again, you can use that to manage your uh, your files within within the disk space. Um, disk space, normally if you are using uh, Postgres at the back, uh, you might need to have a look at the SQL. If you want to do uh, backups or restores, you might want to use a graphical user interface. So PG admin uh, could be the tool that you might need. But I, I wish to stress also that um, uh, you never really need to, to, to write an SQL statement, so go back into the database. If you want to make changes, never, never, never change things within the database if you don't understand what you're doing. Uh, because the database, uh, Dispace database has got over 300 tables in there, and uh, they are very highly normalized. So if you mess up, then you can break the system. Uh, <clears throat> the other one that you could also use is WebMin. Uh, unfortunately, I don't use it, but people recommend it uh, to also look at the files, the file permissions, and, 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 and the lot. Um, Nano is the text editor normally uh, people like to use. There are others like Vi and, uh, and the lot, and I think Hilton has also uh, used Nano on most of uh, these presentations. Um, as I said, there are web browser developer tools, which I mentioned earlier, that you might you need to use as well to just uh, see how the skinning is going. Um, the other little tool I use is uh, to pick colors. Uh, as Hilton has mentioned, you need to have your own uh, corporate colors. Uh, there is this little tool called Pixie. Uh, or what it does is uh, it, it's a small program that la runs on your system on on, on your computer and when you use your mouse to point at any color or you like and then it will give you the translation of those colors in HTML and then you can use those to uh, put them in the in your CSS files. Okay so <clears throat> how do we do uh, Mirage theme customization? Uh, firstly obviously you need to create the overlay folders um, uh, where you're going to put the code that that you, that will change. Um, the idea then is when you build this space, uh, um, 
the Marvin and Ant are very clever in the way they do the build. So they will take the code from the core and then look at your customization and merge the code together before deploying into the WAR file. So, so that's the whole thing about uh, doing it that way. So that next time you upgrade, you only need to change again your stuff in the overlay, you know, so the core code remains the same. So what I normally do, normally I think any standard installation, you don't need to create a lot of unless you are really doing heavy customization. The key ones are the translation files. The translation files are in I18N. Uh, this is where you have your messages files. That is the one that keeps the labels for your uh, for your user interface. And if you want to do multilingual, that's where you do the, the changes. So here you create the overlay in that folder and copy the messages.xml file into that folder. If you are going to have French or uh, other languages, you need to copy those files as well. And you could create your own, for example, if there's no translation, for example, in Swahili, you could create your own translation as well and add it in that file. Then the other thing you have to do is this one, the static. Uh, you have to create it because this is where we put the uh, robots.txt and that's the one that is used to tell uh, crawlers what, how to behave when they try to index your, your disk space. Um, so yeah, that's the, where you put your robots.txt. This is a standard way of uh, how uh, uh, search engine crawlers should be able to transverse your, 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 your system and be able to pick the files that you need to be, uh, to be used in their search engines. Uh, and because this space is, as, as we know, this space is, in, is a database-driven application, uh, so crawlers normally are not very good at, um, at, at looking at those uh, files. And uh, what the robots.txt also tells them is, is the file, which I'll talk about, where it can go and look at the, what they call the sitemap. This enables then the crawlers to be able to index the files, or rather the content that is produced from the database. Uh, cr crawlers normally only are very good at accessing HTML, pure HTML, those are static pages. Um, the other folder you, you need to create is uh, for the images. This is where you place the, the logo and any other images that you might need on your, uh, on your, on your, on your space. Uh, then uh, what normally we've done for, uh, for hours because we've added extra metadata fields into the Dublin core, we needed to have to display those on the uh, item view page where you, if somebody goes to really look at the item view, we need to display a lot of uh, fields. So that's the file that you need to modify the item view dot XSL. As I said, this space hasn't got HTML. So this is the file which is actually in XML and you, it uses uh, the XSL transformations to generate HTML. So this is what you change, you add in uh, the things that you need. Um, the other one you need, you, you always probably change is the page structure.xsl. This is the container that it defines the layout of the whole DSpace user interface. So for example, where, where the header is, where the footer is, where the you know, the side navigation and the load. So if you want to change those things, uh, this is where you go. Um, then the last one is the CSS file. You, this is the, the style sheet uh, file and it controls um, uh, the colors, uh, the sizes of the fonts, and, and the load. So it's more about the, the branding, the look and feel. Um, 
we'll, we'll talk about the Mirage 2. This is based on Mirage 1. Mirage 2 is much more uh, well structured. It's very easy. It's very simple. You don't do, you don't get the whole CSS, but you only get the bits that you want to change, which is uh, make, 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 make it very, uh, very good to use. Um, and this is where you also find the link to the logo. So as I said, if you put your logo in that image file, uh, in this file, CSS style.css, that's where you find the link to that logo, so you can change that as well. Okay, so that is on the look and feel. Uh, the other bits that you might need to look at, which I uh, we'll talk about, I think, in more details when we do the customization, when we, we have a customization um, uh, webinar. Um, display sends emails, notification emails, and mostly the signatures in those emails are based on, uh, you know, generic uh, terms or rather place orders. So you might need to go and change those uh, to put in your, uh, your, your, your your institution's names and change the phone numbers and uh, maybe email addresses where the, uh, the, these, the, the, the links to the, in the emails will point to. So these are found in, uh, in the config. Uh, there's a folder called emails. Um, the other one you, you, you also want to change is the default dot license. This is which gives you the terms and conditions of what uh, the people that are depositing uh, materials into the system needs to know about before they make a decision to do that. So there is again a place, place order text there that you might need to just change to conform to your policies. Um, the other one that we also have changed, as, as I mentioned, we've added extra fields, or which means uh, we've extended uh, the standard um, Dublin core uh, fields. And this space is very, very, um, uh, with this space is being created in such a way that um, you can add in other things that you need. For example, uh, we've added things like we want to track every publication that we've done with our accounting system because uh, we need to know, you know, wh wh which uh, fund uh, that research is coming from. So we've added a field there. And then people need to add um, the entries into that. So that's where you change to, inc to add more fields on the uh, input form. The news-xmlu is just uh, con used to contain text that opens your repository, it, uh, it appears on the home page. Again, this is something that you might, uh, you will need to change because the standard one is just generic. And obviously, once you make all these changes, you need to rebuild your DSpace, as uh, Hilton has uh, emphasized, for the changes to take effect. So that's about uh, customization, just in a quick, in a nutshell. Uh, we're going to talk about really detailed, probably have a, a video to show you how this is all done. Um, the other thing is, I mean, uh, in the opening uh, presentation that I did was, uh, there is this concept of, you know, no repository on its own really makes sense if we are to do research. If research is done across continents, across region, across institutions, then surely we need, we cannot, you know, every repository have all the items that they need in that re one single repository. So then the idea is then how do we make repository, you know, work in tandem? That means they link together um, in a way that uh, machines are able to talk to each other. So this is where interoperability come in. Uh, this organization called Open uh, Archives Initiative, they've uh, created the standards, uh, which is PMH, PMH um, as Protocol for Metadata Harvesting. And every decent repository software or library system or anything that is within the scholarly uh, fields needs to implement this protocol. This space has got this protocol. Uh, the good thing about this space is 
the way it uses this protocol is it both can act as a data provider, which means uh, other systems can be able to ask your repository to provide the data so that they, 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 they can be used in whatever system you, you want to do. And, and again, this is a facility that you can use to, to link your disk space within your campus um, uh, systems. Um, uh, for example, in IDS, we, we are adopting uh, a concept of you know, deposit once, but use everywhere. So every item is deposited in this space. This space becomes uh, a platform that just sits behind. But then the website, uh, the reading lists, the other systems are able to get data from the disk space to display on those systems. But download still happens on the disk space. That way we, we can maintain um, uh, the statistics is in one place. This space also can act as a consumer, meaning that you can actually harvest uh, material from other systems that have uh, uh, that conforms to this protocol and uh, as from dispace 3 uh, dispace also implements what they call the OAIO this this protocol uh, means that not only can you harvest uh, metadata you can also harvest the bitstream which is the full text and uh, systems like uh, the core at the Open University, which is now going to be used as a, as a core uh, router for various um, uh, 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 systems. For example, uh, if I, I, as a researcher, say at IDS, uh, writes a publication, puts it in, a doc in our repository, and I collaborated with someone at Southampton University, there's no need for Southampton University to also deposit in that system. So the idea then is using this interoperability and, and a routing system, uh, this, the systems behind the scene could be able to deposit into, other that, into the other repository. So that's the idea. Again, this is enabled by the whole essence of interoperability. So you need to, uh, to enable that. Um, uh, this, uh, Hilton has mentioned the apps that you need uh, to allow uh, when you install your disk space, and this is the OAI app. And uh, the URL is normally based on uh, this one that you see there. But the key things you also need to do is you need to run um, the indexing so that um, the 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 solar index that supports the OAI is populated. Um, implementing mount, multilingual is very uh, easy, has been made very very easy in this space, as it has followed the whole standards of using um, uh, uh, translations. So every user. Uh, labels that you see on the user interface are actually controlled uh, in the files called uh, messages uh, XML files and uh, each one has got a uh, an ISO uh, a variable that denotes what sort of language to use so the, so what you do is if as I said you copy those into your overlay and modify them. And then in dispace.config, you set this uh, parameter, default.local. Uh, if you have one language, it's just en. If you want to have multiple languages, you, you put a comma delimited list. So as I said, if, for example, you want to create a language in, uh, say, Swahili or Kotha or whatever, you can create your own messages.file and then add it in there and your, your disk space will, will change. And immediately you do that, on the user interface you have uh, a drop down or a link which will allow users to select the language they, they want. Uh, I have to emphasize though that this only changes the user interface, the content doesn't really change. It's up to you to add the content, the appropriate content, or again you could, uh, this space has a facility where you can have two uh, titles, one in English and the other one translated, or you can extend the Dublin code to include 
uh, maybe uh, abstracts in both uh, languages that you are trying to sell. Um, discovery is, uh, is a concept, uh, uh, I mean, it's about your content being discoverable in various places, third party tools, uh, your other systems, uh, maybe VooFind or uh, search engines. And for it to be really effective, you need to be able to generate the sitemaps, as I, as I mentioned earlier, because this space stores its content in databases. And for every item in that databases, you need to query that database to be able to, to get the text out so that you are able to index that. So the idea there is uh, this space generates these sitemaps that are standards uh, based. And usually, if you go to your this space and access, uh, you know, run this URL, uh, your your dispatch URL forward slash sitemap or forward slash HTML map, you see them there. That is if you've run this gener dispatch generate sitemap. And then in the robots.txt, if you look at the uh, the structure uh, that is given in the do dispatch documentation from DuraSpace, at the top there are links to these uh, sitemaps. This is where when a crawler comes in, say from Google Scholar or from Bing or Yahoo, they look at this robots.txt and then if they find uh, these sitemaps, they all go to that sitemap. The sitemap will have all the links of the items in your disk space. And then what they'll do is they'll call each of those links. Then they'll be able to extract the text so that they can place it in their indexes. Without this, your disk space they only you only be discovering just the maybe the home page rather than the actual items, so it's very very important you do that. Um, again, the other bit is the web statistics. Um, this space, I think, from the start has always had a way of um, capturing uh, statistics, and these were mostly web visits. So if someone accesses your page, um, then uh, you need to know where they're coming from, uh, what type of user agent they're using. This is where, you know, what type of browser, what type of equipment, the date and time, which pages they went to. And uh, Google Analytics is able to capture those, uh, uh, those events. So what you have to do is you go to Google, apply for, uh, for, for Google Analytics key, uh, then that you just insert it into the um, into your dispatch.config, and then automatically dispatch will be able. To, I mean, dispatch will be able to send uh, these kind of uh, visits to Google and Google Analytics, and then you can log into Google Analytics and be able to view uh, the statistics. Uh, I would also emphasize that um, for this space we found long time ago we found there was a big problem because um, we couldn't track uh, the downloads uh, because if you think about it um, this space, uh, the G Google Analytics generally uses JavaScript code which is placed on every page and uh, that JavaScript responds to the page load event so when the page is loaded that's when it triggers and sends that information but the download happens to be on that page as well. So you have to do another you know, task to be able to initiate the download. And that, is, that generates the on-click event. So by that time, obviously, uh, the, the, the statistic, the, that event has already been sent. So it was very difficult to track that on-click event. There were, aware, there were workarounds. For example, you could route all your uh, your downloads through another page so that you can trap that event. But Google became very um, wary about that and uh, they penalized people who did that because uh, uh, scammers use those, those techniques as well. So you could uh, create events, but they are very difficult to do as well. Uh, so that is one problem that we found. But I would now say, as from Dispatch 5, uh, 
tracking downloads using Google Analytics is now much better. It's easier now because um, rather than using the JavaScript based uh, uh, um, method, uh, this space now actually sends those uh, events directly to Google Analytics via the application programming interface. And also the other thing is you can view the statistics within your disk space. Therefore, you don't need to give everyone that, those that need to look at statistics, uh, you know, credentials to the uh, Google Analytics. They can see that. So that is done in, um, that has happened from disk space five. And I'm sure, I think we might also have uh, probably uh, as we go on a webinar on how to set that one up as well. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you. Um, Irene? Hi, does anybody have any questions for us? I'm not sure where Irina is, but uh, does anybody have any questions for us? Thanks a lot, Nathan and Hilton. So we already have some questions coming up uh, and please, if you have your question or comment, use the text chat for this. So we have a question from uh, Sherzot. Uh, we're going to organize a corporate archive network, digital archive of state archive organizations, over 100. Can we use this space for this purpose? So I think Hilton already answered yes, definitely. Uh, would you like to <laughs> provide more details or shall we go to the next question? There was also a question from Omar about using GSP UI and Hilton provided a URL where customization of GSP UI is uh, described uh, and I'll send you all those links as well from the text chat. Uh, uh, Yolanta is asking about multilingual user interface. We would need to add more fields for title abstract. Can you expand a little? Thanks. And also maybe if you could provide more details to share those. Okay, just for, for Shirza, uh I'm not a JSP user interface uh, theme builder. We didn't use the JSP user interface. Uh, we standardized on the XML user interface. Sorry. Um, okay, uh, can I just uh, say something about the multilingual user interface? Um, if you want to add uh, extra field, uh, you, if you log in into your DSpace, you are an administrator. You have uh, where there's uh, uh, metadata in, uh, on the registry. There's a registry there, which uh, you can use then to uh, go in to give you all the um, uh, metadata or rather the, um, the schemas that DSpace uses. You choose the Dublin core one, and then you can create your metadata there. 
your extra fields. If that is if they don't, if you find that they are not already there, then to enable them to be able to be used on your system, then you need to uh, add them on the submission user interface. Uh, that's the one, the file that I mentioned uh, area is found in the config. So you, you, you have to do that. And within the, that re the registry, there are two. There's one for the schema, there's another one for, uh, for type of um, uh, files that can be uploaded into this space. And we just found, for example, uh, certain files like the new ones, EPUBs, are not there, so you can add that as well in there. So that's, that's how you extend your Dublin call within um, this space. And then once you've done that, obviously, you might need to have those displayed on the page itself. Uh, so that's where you have to go and change the, to make changes in the XSL file, uh, which is the item viewer file. And then, yes, as, as uh, again, uh, Hilton has just put across there, you need also to modify the indexes so that those fields are able to be indexed. Um, you can go further again by adding another facet to to the to the to the display so that uh, your people can access those quickly, just like the way the standard facets are on author and uh, a subject. Thanks a lot, uh, Hilton and Nathan, and uh, thank you for attending this webinar. If you have your questions, that's probably the last chance to ask them today. Uh, I'll send you the slides, all the links mentioned in the text chat and the recording. And uh, our next webinar is uh, next week on Thursday, same time uh, on how to upgrade space. So if you're interested uh, in uh, the topic, I do encourage you to attend it. Uh, I don't know, Nathan and Hilton, are we going to address this issue of full text search in the next webinars? Uh, we, we, we will um, address it, uh, as I think, in the next webinar as the detail, but all, all I can say now is uh, if you, because uh, Dispace uses solar to, to search that, you need to be able to run the um, uh, filter media 
uh, job to be able to to do the extraction of the uh, the text from the PDFs into the solar index so that is already there it can be done but we'll talk about it in more detail uh, in the in the customization Thank you very much. So I guess if there are no other questions, I'll be closing this session shortly. And I wish you all a very nice weekend and hope to see you next week on Thursday on our next webinar. Thanks again. Bye.